So my name, Gerd, G-E-R-D. If I ask the AI to figure out who Gerd is, you know, it's not an English name. You know what it says, gastrointestinal reflux disease. Right? This is the most common Gerd on the internet. If I use voice control to speak to my email or to an AI, Gerd will always turn into nerd or GERD, like the, the belt, or whatever, it will not get my name. And this is actually quite interesting when you speak to AI about when we look at what AI does, you know, it still can't figure out my name, but we think that AI is going to be like a human. And the reality is that artificial intelligence is really machine intelligence, and I'll explain what that means. Machine intelligence is super powerful and super important. It's probably, like many people have said, kind of like electricity in so many ways. It's like a total reset of what we are and how we do things. It is far, however, from human intelligence. If I meet you later after my speech, it takes us about 0.4 seconds to measure the other person, to see if you're interesting or if you're a threat, potential partner, whatever, without saying a single word. This is what humans do. Because we see the world in a 360 degree way. We see with the eyes, the ears, we actually see with the ears, right? We smell it, we taste it. Very difficult for a machine to do that. You know, the best AI today and the best also for the graphic systems uh, realize about three to 5% of the real world. So it's really interesting to see how we're sitting here today and thinking about AI as the next level of enterprise. Really what's happening around us is that the next 10 years will bring more change than the previous 100 years. Now that sounds kind of crazy. When we think about the last 100 years, World War I and II, the nuclear bomb, the internet, right, big. But now today we have dozens of technologies that sound like science fiction, they're becoming real. I'll show you six of them. I call them the six kingmakers, because whoever is leading in those six is kind of leading the world. The first, of course, is AI. China, Russia, and America have all said they want to lead the world in AI, because whoever is leading AI leads the world, rules the world. Very big conversation about what that actually means. I come back to that. The other one is quantum computing, supercomputing. You need both, of course, to make it work. And there's lots of trillions of dollars are going to that turf to figure out how we can compute better. Fusion energy. We're roughly about 15 years away from nuclear fusion, which is the opposite of fission. So it's basically clean nuclear energy. Once we have that, it's the end of energy issues. That means unlimited energy, unlimited water, unlimited food, unlimited travel, space, and so on. I mean, mine 15 years, think about that for a second. Maybe a little bit too late for me, but your kids will live in a world of unlimited energy. And so we have 20 years to figure this out. Uh, of course, genetic engineering, synthetic biology, creating fuels from uh, synthetic biology, and of course, change in the human genome to avoid cancer. We are already in Western countries living one third of a year longer every year. So my kids, on average, are going to be 100 years old, unless other things happen, of course. 100 years. I mean, there's some mind-boggling change when we look at this, and of course, ultimately, geoengineering, to put the Earth back into the green sphere, to fix what we've done. Complicated topic, of course, all of those are complicated, right? They're subject to geopolitics and so on and so on. But it's really interesting to see we have three big revolutions. The first one is the digital revolution. All of us know what that means. I'll explain more detail. The second one that's actually much bigger is the sustainability revolution. I was just here yesterday speaking at an Accenture event about sustainability, and now it's completely clear that sustainable, circular, green is the new digital. This is the number one topic. All of you have noticed, of course, in the last couple of weeks, the weather has been like, what? You know, we're, we're trying to figure out what exactly is happening. Not just in Singapore, but in Europe, where I live in Zurich, it's 34 degrees in Zurich. 
Is that normal or is it just part of an aberration or what's happening here? So we're now quite clearly moving into a world where sustainability will be a hundred times as powerful as digital. So everything is switching to renewable, to circular, and finally, of course, the most important part is the purpose revolution, which is the question, why are we doing things? What's the purpose of all this technology? What kind of economics do we have? You may have noticed until COVID, we had pretty much straightforward capitalist economics, and now all of a sudden we're thinking, it's not enough to just think about profit and growth. We have to go beyond this. And the drivers of this are the millennials, the so Gen Y. Many of them are in the room today. So if you're between 20 and 35, 40, you're going to ask different questions about purpose, about people, about the planet. Now, in technology, there's four big sectors. All of these are basically resulting in exponential change. So information technology, biotechnology, building things from organic mechanisms that we use now in engineering, energy technology, the next 1,000 unicorns, you know, billion-dollar companies, they will be in climate technology. So battery technology, uh, agricultural software, food systems, a huge amount of money. This is a great opportunity for Singapore, of course, all, all four of us. And finally, the explosion in the last few months about AI technology. Machines that can think. Don't be confused about this. Machines do not think. Machines are not intelligent. Machines don't live. Machines don't exist. They're not conscious. They don't have human agency. Regardless of all of that, they're quite useful. We should not confuse the fact that a machine can speak to us and sound very intelligent with consciousness. It takes a lot more than an autocomplete. Some people would say, evilly, a parrot, a fancy parrot, to be conscious. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second, but basically what's happening with all of these things is we're moving to a world where this is going to be, like electricity, a huge shift. So AI, in many ways, is kind of like the next electricity. And if you see this chart, you've seen this before, the fourth industrial revolution. Now we have the fifth industrial revolution. Everything is becoming smart, not just connected, not just the cloud, not just data, but actually smart. I mean, of course, you would believe if you work for a big organization, most organizations don't use the data very smartly. The data isn't very clean, it's kind of a mess, we don't know which, what is what, and so on, and now we can actually look at the data and make it smart. Not intelligent like humans, because it takes imagination, intuition, but smart. So let me define artificial intelligence. Demis Hassabis, the CEO of DeepMind, says, AI is computer systems that turn information and data into knowledge. Now, if you're sitting here and you are a knowledge worker, most of us are knowledge workers, right? this should concern you. Right? If a machine has knowledge, what do we have? I mean, you go to school right, to have knowledge, and then when you come out, you're supposed to get paid for your knowledge. What if the machine does it for free, which it does? What kind of knowledge do machines have? Well, the answer is binary knowledge, you know, zeros and ones. If you feed all of the world's philosophers into IBM Watson or any AI system, right, it will do the whole thing, it will read every possible book about philosophy in roughly two minutes. And then you ask a question. The machine will give you a perfect answer, but the machine is not a philosopher. Why is that? Because the machine has not understood anything that it says, it just has the data. It has no understanding what any of it actually means. Machine intelligence is not about meaning, it's about patterns. We have to understand the very big difference. Human life is about meaning. Think about what moves us the most. It's not data. At least we don't think of it that way. <laughs> it's relationships, engagement, meaning, experiences, that's why you're here and not watching a screen. And data is just part of that. So it's really important to realize when we talk about generative AI, AI that can make things, it's the same idea but turning information and data into content, into media. And therein lies the strength and the weakness. 
because the data that this machine is using, like ChatGPT, is data from the internet, which means mostly Western internet, white guy internet, you could say. Right? I mean, the Chinese language, the Malay language, the Indian languages, 367 of them, they're not part of the data model of OpenAI, obviously. They're not being fed into this. So it's a really different scenario as to what happens here. I'll show you some examples. So this, this example here is an AI that uh, creates old philosopher pictures and, and uh, musicians. And this AI here allows us to change images on the fly. So if you're in a creative business, you can change the picture of the dog without making a new one. It's all very useful stuff. This one is a, the latest Adobe solution where you can have a global zoom on a picture. So Adobe will go and look for the context of your picture and zoom in and out as much as you want. Very powerful tool if you're writing for a magazine or things like that, very powerful stuff. And of course, looking further, we have a machine that makes images based on a text prompt. So if you're good with prompting, you can generate some pretty funky pictures. This is Expedia, now has an app where you can search and put together your smart travel. So if you want to go to Hawaii, you just tell it how much budget you have, what you want to do, and the AI will look for the perfect matches. Uh, it's part of the Expedia app now. It's quite interesting. It's not rocket science, obviously, but it's interesting. Um, Wendy's has now a chatbot that you can order from, fast food place. That's going to be a disaster, as I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, Whatever you say, it has to be perfectly within the range of the bot. Right? So I think that could be quite different when you have a different accent or so. You have things like this, you know, fake clips, fake videos of every imaginable person. And this is obviously not Tom Cruise, but you know, somebody put it together. And I use it a lot in my videos on YouTube to create different kinds of backgrounds. And I also use it to make myself we look a little bit different. With intelligent computing. You know, we can only compete with human intelligence. That's not really an improvement, I don't think, but... Now we have a, a guy who put together a clip of the most famous Swiss person in history, Heidi. Right? And, it, and an AI made this image, right? this animation, basically with the prompt of saying, make a film about Heidi, right? Including the music and all of the different things and it was able to pull that from YouTube videos to create a fake Heidi clip. So, <laughs> well, anyway, what's happening in terms of enterprise, clearly, if you're looking at this chart here, you know, generative AI in enterprise has a lot of different functions like synthetic data. This is super interesting because what it does, it creates data rather than real life data. It makes up data to create experiments in the cloud, like for drug, uh, recovery, discovery, and things like that. It's very powerful stuff. Uh, it's a, a shortcut to many things used in many industries and actually creating lots and lots of use cases here. So the other day I was thinking like, you know, if everybody has a bot, what about me? Yeah. So I had a guy that is a good designer, web designer. He built a bot called the GERD bot, uh, the GERD.ai. All of my books and videos and social media feeds and blog posts for the last 20 years are in the bot. So you can ask the bot a question that you would ask me, and it will give you an answer. You should try it out sometime. But right now it's not speaking yet, but it will eventually do that. So here's the bottom line on this. By the end of next year, ChatGPT or similar learning models, language models, will be on every mobile phone around the world using voice commands and even work without internet. So imagine this is four billion phones or other devices like wristwatches or little clip-ons that you can speak to that will give you an instant answer. For example, on banking, on healthcare, local travel, tourism. And this will be used in a way that's not just the mobile phone. That brings up all kinds of issues, obviously, like what is the truth of the answer? Who is in charge of what's being said? And imagine that actually becoming sort of the, you have the genie in the pocket, right? This a personal AI. I always say it could be heaven or it could be hell. It could be heaven in so many ways because it would be very convenient. But just like Google Maps, you know, we use Google Maps locally and we try to figure out where to go. 
Sometimes we say, no, if you're from Singapore, you would say, no, this, this can't be true. This is definitely not the right way to go. Happens all the time on Google Maps. And we ask questions. But with an AI like this that sounds very smart, would we ask a question when we say, for example, who should I vote for? Or what's the truth about Hassan? Would give me a question. Try out ChatGPT, ask it about me. It will tell you flat out lies about me. That's because many things I write about are quoted from others. So if I ask ChatGPT, is Gerd an expert and a scientist of artificial intelligence? It says, yes, Gerd is a scientist and he's published many papers on AI. None of that is true. Because it has read my name in association with other information. <laughs> right? So it's, it tends to hallucinate and make up stuff. Regardless of all of this, AI is the new electricity which means that everything we do will be touched by AI. In good ways and in not so good ways, but basically three different things, right? Data everything, cloud everything, that's kind of an old hat, but it's also really big still. And the last one is smart everything. And I think if we turn this around and we don't speak about AI, then we should speak about IA, intelligent assistance. Then we are in reality. Really what the systems do is they are smart software as opposed to dumb software. Because a lot of software that we used to use isn't very smart. It never actually learns and picks up on important things. But now with machine learning and deep learning, we can fix that. So IA is a much better word than AI because AI kind of sounds like transcendence or black mirror or, you know, ex machina. We're nowhere close to that. So really what we need to do is think about the cloud and data in connection with smartness, with intelligent assistance. And that's really the path forward for enterprise AI. So if we look, for example, at the greening of society and green energy and all the things that are happening here on this curve, this is a uh, climate tech innovation curve from Gardner. You see all the things like smart meters, supply chain logistics. It's a little bit hard to read, I think, for the resolution. We're going to publish the slides later so you can take a good look at that. Uh, but basically, this is all driven by AI. So here's the ticket to the future in a nutshell. Big blue, not IBM, but technology. And big green is the ticket. Those two things together, that's pretty much what we have. Green is the new digital. And this is how we're going to rebuild the world with green energy. And Singapore has taken the lead in this in many ways. As you can see right now, many constructions and the smart port and all these kind of things. Mind-boggling developments. We've seen this happening all over the world already. For example, now a smart city in the U.S. Uh, called, what is it called again? It's called Telosa. That's being built in the desert in New Mexico. Busan, smart city. Singapore, the TUAS, smart port. And, of course, Neom. And, you know, the story goes on. Now we're building cities that are based on AI and on smart technology. And they will become the new normal. I guarantee you any city that will not be smart and connected and sustainable will be not in favor in 2030. Any company ignoring sustainability and, and AI will not exist in 2030 because that's kind of the new makeup of society. So going back to this, you know, the really interesting part, and again, maybe a little bit hard to read on the chart here, but we can tell basically what's happening because of technology the energy transition investments are going up like crazy. So renewable energy, nuclear energy, energy storage, electric vehicles exploding. Uh, this is the number one opportunity in the world today because we're going to shift away from the fossil fuel economy to the renewable economy and maybe next generation nuclear as well in the next 10 years. And we see this chart. Don't believe for a minute that going green will just cost money. That was true 10 years ago. Now it will make money. It is creating a new economy. If we're looking at this chart, we can safely say, well, what's happening here is the net positive. You know, in 10 years, this is the biggest industry on the planet. Very, very powerful stuff. So if you're in technology and stuff, this is, of course, the place where you want to be, the place where you want to go. Now, here's another interesting thing to think about. Intelligence defined, this is Stuart Russell, from UC Berkeley says, intelligent means having the power to shape the world in your interest. 
if we were to create an intelligence, a superhuman intelligence, a machine intelligence that is smarter than us, it would eventually seek to shape the world in its interest. That's logical, right? The most intelligent entity rules the world. So for us to create an intelligence that is more intelligent than us brings a lot of risk. And to create a machine that can be generally intelligent like a human creates a lot of risk. Now we have machines that are starting to understand what we're saying. This is just the beginning. So, you know, any variation in language still is a big problem. So you have any accent whatsoever, it's always difficult with those systems. But they'll be fixed in two or three years. Nat natural language programming, image recognition, all that stuff is happening. And of course, now machines are starting to understand the real world. And machines are reading every single data feed. ChatGPT 10 will basically have real-time information of six, six billion people. Everything we've ever done, everything we've ever looked at, everything we've ever talked about. So that could lead to many good things, but also to many bad things, because the machine may in inadvertently, what's called the alignment problem, not really understand what the mission is. So if you told artificial intelligence today, please fix the climate change problem, you know what it would do, right? Eliminate all humans. That, that, that's the most logical answer. That would just be slightly inconvenient for us, but there's some way we have to think about this, how we can actually do better. So the control issue is big. And this is why we have to collaborate to control AI in such a way that we can harvest its benefits and not too much of the side effects. And currently, this is a bit of a race. Right? We have China as a major player in AI, and of course the US in the middle is Europe. And Europe is the leader in regulation. <laughs> Right. It's not the leader in, in innovation, really. Well, I, that would be kind of unfair to say, but it's really a mix of the two. You know, Europeans, are, of course, great on regulation. Now, if we look at this chart, is, again, it's hard to read. China has a big leg up on global conference publications, paper citations, and the biggest model in AI, that's in China. But America, the blue line here, has a big leg up in chips, of course, the whole debate we have right now, and down here, in private investment. So right now we have this interesting back and forth between China and the US and who is going to come out as a winner. I think there won't be a winner here. Clearly it's going to be a more collaborative effort in the long run. We see all the stuff that's happening in the UK, in the US, you know, and China is still just a very small part of this in terms of actual innovation in AI. But it's hard to say because we're never really sure how much information we have about what really happens in China. And so all of that stuff is coming together to create sort of this scenario. What we don't want is an arms race. We don't want racing towards power because of artificial intelligence. And that is something that really concerns people, I think. So if we're looking at this chart here, it's interesting to see that uh, in Asia, you see your left, get out of the way here, China, and of course Saudi Arabia as well, and, and uh, Singapore is somewhere in the middle, it's not on the chart, right? Public sentiment towards AI is positive in Asia. In Europe, it's the reverse, right? Look at this, it's half. So in Europe, we think that AI is not all that good sometimes, and we have concerns, we have more regulation. There's a huge cultural difference. And looking at this chart, for example, we see all this money in Asia here going into natural language processing, computer vision, machine learning, clearly exploding. So it's a cultural thing as to how much we react to that and what we can do. Let's talk about humans and machines and what that all means for us. So most importantly, intelligence. I mentioned in the beginning, human intelligence, this is the Indian version of it, Moody, Manas, Chitta, and Ahambra, and basically what we have is eight different kinds of intelligence, social, cultural, kinesthetic, musical, intellectual, Human intelligence is very complicated. Machine intelligence is one thing, data. It's intellectual, if you wish, Simple, simply put. Right? So what we have over here is digital intelligence, which is the cloud, data, computing, logic. And the machines are beating us there, slowly but surely. Machines will beat us on just the computing power 
very soon. But what we have, of course, as humans is the opposite. We have human intelligence, right? so organic, biological, all the intelligence that involves creativity, imagination, intuition. Can you imagine a machine with intuition? Well, I think we can imagine a machine that pretend to have uh, imagination, pretend to feel love, but pretending to feel love is not the same than love, right? It's just a simulation, it's like a computer game. So it's interesting to see where this is going. This is obviously Mick Jagger. The amazing part of this is not the Boston robot at Boston Dynamics, it's Mick Jagger, right? I mean, he's 77 years old. <laughs> and the robot is just basically copying the moves. And I'm sure it took him a couple of years to get the robot to do this. And probably not anywhere close to Mick, you know, for safety reasons. But it's an interesting demonstration. So what we have to understand, intelligence is not just data processing. I mean, that would be too easy. Data processing is what machines do, logic, right? The performance of love, empathy, compassion is not the same as compassion. It's just the performance of it. And this is what ChatGPT does really well. It gives you very smart sounding answers. They sound very human. They make us think there's a human, but, but really it's just a machine doing a copy. And that's also very valuable, of course, but machines are different. Humans aren't binary, real life transcends data. I think we all know this. Logic alone is not enough. I mean, if that was the case, we would be becoming machines. So let's keep that in mind when we think about the future, which way we're going here. The most important part of this is that routines will be done by machines. Anything that's routine, a machine will learn. Routine meaning, for example, routine coding, you know, lowest possible level. <laughs> Analytics, financial planning, engineering, like 3D printing a house, machines can do that. The house will be very ugly, but it, it can be done, right? Uh, machines can drive a car, but not really like a human. As we've seen it, we don't really have self-driving cars. You know, we have demos of it. But that's really what's happening. So this routine means basically we have invented a powerful new general purpose technology. That's what AI is. General purpose technology like electricity, like the internet, general purpose. And that is huge especially if you're an enterprise, because there's so many things that we do in enterprise organizations that are inefficient, that don't really work, that need help. Limitless room for improvement. But we should not think of that as being beyond routine. And we should not take out the human from our work environment. Because it only works when it works together, the two different kinds of intelligences. As we can see here on this chart, again, a little bit hard to read, it shows the business objectives of AI, and they all are nuts and bolts, right? Improve operational efficiency, improve customer service. Yeah. Simple nuts and bolts. That's why I prefer to call it IA. Just making our software, our technology better. Uh, the scary part is this, so this is actually a really positive part in my world, but you can see the output of AI-assisted knowledge workers here. For example, if you're a paralegal or office and, and sales support, for example, you can be four or five times as efficient using AI. This is good news for us, it's good news for the organization. Is it good news for employment? I'm not so sure. <laughs> if I could be five times as efficient, maybe you just need one GERD and not the other four people. So it's something to think about how we can deal with this. But basically, this is what it's all about and I enabled knowledge workers. And I can guarantee you one thing, a person with AI will replace the person without AI, but the AI by itself will not replace the person. In some instances it could, like playing chess. Right. Machines play chess pretty well, better than humans. But the most important chess games today are humans and machines playing against other humans and machines. Uh, that's where it gets really interesting. So, what we have here, a great chart from Accenture, is the possibility of automation. That's the green chart here. Office and admin support, sales and related. And the rest one is the potential for augmentation. And that will change all of our jobs. 
I think mostly to the positive, but it's a bit shocking to see that a machine can do things that we used to do. Like, I use it all the time now for writing things, like I'm writing my book, Technology versus Humanities, from 2016. Now I'm using ChatGPT to rewrite my book. It's given me lots of great ideas, but without the good text to begin with, I would still have nothing. So it's a really interesting uh, scenario here. So um, basically, Goldman Sachs says generative AI could impact 300 million jobs globally. Impact, not destroy. <laughs> but here's the bottom line. That's, I think, something that we have to understand. Right? It's quite straightforward. If you work like a robot, a robot will take your job. Don't work like a robot. Don't let your kids work like robots. Don't take a job that's robotic. And even worse, if you learn like a robot, you'll never have a job. And this is unfortunate today. Many schools, universities, colleges, we learn like robots. Eh? We download information for later. This is utterly useless. We need to acquire information as we go forward into new things that we do every single day until we die. Lifelong learning. And this is why this pyramid is so crucial. The pyramid of work is now being changed by artificial intelligence because the lower part of this pyramid, intellectual knowledge, data, and information, machines can do. At least part of it. What's left to us, and this is good news, I think, is the upper part, the human-only turf. Purpose, wisdom, understanding, all of those things. And that's what we have to focus on in the near future. So let me get to the uh, AI ethics part, and then I'll wrap up. Most importantly to understand is that technology doesn't have ethics. I mean, technology is computer code, it's logic, it's machines, it's binary. It doesn't understand values, emotions, any of those things. So, but it's important to realize that our societies, and this is especially true for Singapore, and we're driven by our values, by our humanity, not by our technology. Technology is what fuels it, but we're defined by our humanity. So this is the question we have to ask. When we talk about AI in the enterprise, we have to ask the question not if or how, because, yeah, if, of course, we could do this, technology is there, but why? What does it do? What value does it create? Does it help the customer? Does it help me? Does it help society? And we have to be very careful on this transition you know, from the IA to the automation to the augmentation to autonomous intelligence. I do not think that we should pursue autonomous intelligence, machines that are generally intelligent. I think that could end very badly for us. You know, think about an AI with an IQ of one billion. This will be like you going to the mountains and going hiking, and uh, while you're going hiking, you're squashing 5,000 ants. You know, you're stepping on little ants, and you wouldn't even know because, you know, they basically not, don't matter. So this is a really, really powerful thing that we have to think about where that's going as we're moving into this future and kind of going into a world where AI is going to be absolutely everywhere. So uh, Mark Andreessen, the Netscape um, founder and investor now, he says, basically, artificial general intelligence is about understanding, synthesizing, and generating knowledge. That's a very important statement. And when we think about ethics, we have to think about, do we have to protect what makes us human? And now you may have heard, now there's an effort under the way to create an international artificial intelligence agency. The IAIA, I call it. Would that be useful? Well, that's very hard to say. Maybe it would be about over-regulation. I don't know. <laughs> but like the atomic agency, without the International Atomic Agency, we wouldn't be sitting here today. So there's something that we have to think about, something that's really worth considering as we move into this future about AI basically changing everything. Great quote by, by Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. He says, technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. If we want something from the future, whatever benefit that is, we have to make it happen. Because technology is about efficiency. It's a tool. And ethics is the same thing. You know, ethics is about knowing the difference between what you have the right or the power to do and what is the right thing to do. Social media is a great example. 
Facebook and other companies have every right to do what they are doing, which is harvesting our information and selling it to advertisers. But is it the right thing to do? There's a very big difference here in terms of where that's going. So the ultimate question really I, I pose to you today is um, who will be Open the pod bay doors, please, mission control for humanity? You've seen the movie, Space Odyssey 2021, where the oh, AI controls the ship. Right. Open the pod bay doors. Hello, Hal, do you read me? I'm afraid I can't do that. Do you read me, Hal? We gotta think about that. So I'm gonna wrap up with a summary and talk about what it means when we get to this. So just real quick, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here. As you can see, I was vastly ambitious about the speed of my delivery, but that is what usually happens. So, enterprise AI, let me summarize the most important key points, okay? First, we should think less about superhumanity, about machine uh, sentience, about machine consciousness. We should think about competence and actual usefulness. The future of artificial intelligence is about competence of machines to get the job done. It's not about them becoming like us. And I think actually it's a kind of a stupid object to try to build a machine that's like us, because we want the machine to do our job, right? To get the work done. That is the objective. It should be less about reaching artificial general intelligence, and it should be more about general purpose capabilities. Let the machine learn our language, let the machine speak back to us, let it do our taxes, let it do our banking, let it do all of the mumbo jumbo that we have to put up with every single day, the commodity work and help us get to a different future. It should be less about disruption, right? As Facebook liked to say, move fast and break things. We can't do that anymore. We have to move fast and create new things about greasing the wheels, make it work better, not about changing everything. It's not about replacing human workers. It's about augmenting, enabling, empowering them. Most importantly for enterprises, we got to keep the human in the loop. It is a very bad idea to say that we're going to use AI to replace people and fire as many people as we can to use software instead. That is not going to work, doesn't create value. <laughs> what we can do is, of course, increase our margin, our efficiencies by using AI. And lastly, it's not about just growing profit and, and margins, but shifting towards a new world. People, planet, purpose, prosperity. If we can use AI to solve cancer, to have better free healthcare, to shift our work scenarios, to build new energy, to fly to other planets, that would be amazing. It's really up to us to make those decisions. So in the end, it's gonna be about this, right? Proaction and precaution. That's why I say when we think about the future, especially in enterprise, we have to invest as much in people and humanity as we invest in technology. That also means investing in our people, like learning and development and human resources and all of the things that we do, not just investing in new software. I want to leave you with a thought about the future mindset. I work on this a lot. I think the future really is all about us understanding it. And let's make no mistake about this. The future isn't about tomorrow. The future is here. All you have to do is go outside and take a look what's happening in the greening of the city, in different smart technologies, in the smart city, smart environments, smart airplanes, all the discussion, we need to have a future mindset. Um, Barbara Hubbard, famous futurist, said, your mindset contains your future. So if you're thinking about the future every day, and Bill Gates says we should spend one hour a day in the future, every single day, then we need these things, optimism, foresight, questions, imagination. That's the skills of the future. The future isn't built by pessimists or by dystopians or by people saying, no, 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 it can't be done. Or by people saying, I'm afraid of the future, I won't even have kids. That's actually quite a trend these days. We have to think about the future positively because I really think in the end, the future is better than we think. And that's especially important with artificial intelligence. If we get this right, we can finally get to a future where maybe we only work three, four hours a day for three days a week for the same money. Thank you very much for listening.